Fairhall. I'm very pleased to introduce her. Before I do so, I just want to say that uh, as part of PCMI every year, we have um, a uh, what's called the Senior Scholar Role. It's often funded by the Clay Math Institute, but various years it's funded by other people. This year it's funded by the Institute for Advanced Study. We call her the Karen Ulenbeck uh, Distinguished Scholar. And so her role is to just be here, talk to people, and be a guru. So we're extremely, <laughs> extremely pleased that she agreed to come and to be a great resource to people, and that hopefully uh, it will um, be good for her as well. And, uh, and I'm very happy that she's been willing to give a public talk. So uh, uh, Barbara Terhal is a very distinguished scholar in, in the world of quantum computation. Uh, she received her PhD in Amsterdam and has been had held positions at IBM and Caltech and uh, uh, the Forschungszentrum uh, Jülich, and uh, is now at QTech and, and Delft. And uh, again, I'm very pleased to have you here. Thank you for coming. Okay, yeah, thanks. All right. Uh, okay. <laughs> yeah, I'm happy to be here. Uh, I know the focus here is on, on mathematics, and uh, I like doing mathematics, but I also like to interface with uh, physicists, and a particular experimental physicist. And so my talk will be a little bit of a wild mix of, of everything, um, which I'll see how, how it will go down. And I also was trying to judge a little bit what the audience would be. And some people have heard about quantum error correction and the very nice lectures by Del Foss here. So for them, there may be not much new in, in this, this lecture. And um, other people just already know about this. And, but maybe there are other people who are quite new to quantum computing or barely know what a qubit is. So trying to address everybody. Um, and I'm just, I think, just trying to make some global points of perhaps interest. Um, so the first point I want to make is that for me, at least, it's very clear that um, quantum error correction and fault tolerance, the application of a theory that we've developed, is a real necessity for building a digital quantum computer. And a digital quantum computer is a device that can do, uh, you know, everything we could do classically on our classical computers, not with Amy with the same speed or same clock speed, but it could all the, you know, all the classical computations. And then on top of that, it could run quantum algorithms. So that's a very ambitious goal. Maybe it's too ambitious, and maybe at, you know, 50 years from now, we'll find we'll have some, some completely different device, some completely different beast. Um, because also classical computing is moving away to different paradigms like AI and so on. Um, so we'll see. But there is no fundamental no-go uh, that we have other than it being, you know, experimentally quite hard, uh, that shows that it's impossible. So, you know, you can argue as a theorist, then you say, well, okay, what can I contribute as a theorist? Um, well, I can help the experiments that, uh, to succeed. I can uh, develop different schemes, like also what I think Nicolas Del Foss has been discussing in this lecture. Um, I can try to analyze the data that they get uh, in the experiments, um, and we're just going to, you know, try and learn what we find, so to say. All right, um, so I think what is nice, or at least uh, I think I should, some people I think find uh, they have are a little bit impatient with quantum computing, and maybe this comes also from industrial interest. So, you know, it sort of has to pay off in the short term, and I think it's very important to have sort of the long-term perspective on this, and also that um, I sort of we had to, you know, start from scratch entirely with quantum computing in many levels. And um, so the point is that everything that we engineer and we do, um, you know, in real life or in, in technical life, is is full tolerance. Is you know everything we do is prone to errors, um, and um, we want to keep functionality despite these errors, right? You think about storage on a hard drive. You think about copying DNA. Um, you think about solving, you know, doing a calculation. If you're very bad at doing calculations, you do it three times. You take a majority answer, and maybe you're more likely, of course, it's not, not, not advisable to proceed this way, but, uh, you know, you debug your code, et cetera, right? So error correction is, is ubiquitous, and any engineering has to be full tolerant. And here I've shown sort of a, a caricature, a little bit of, you know, what we want to achieve is a paperclip. So a paperclip loses, doesn't lose its functionality if it's not quite the same shape as you bought it. Um, and that's sort of what we want. And so it is robust towards small variations in shape. But um, where we're at with qubits is entirely a different thing. We are actually at the, you know, what we have is a qubit or physical qubits that um, 
any small you know, noise uh, disturbs their state, basically. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about what a qubit is, if you're sort of a little bit new to this. So, um, you know, at its basic level, a qubit is a two-dimensional um, vector in a Hilbert space, it's a two-dimensional complex space, but we like to represent this vector. We can also represent it as a point on the three-dimensional, on a ball, basically a sphere. We call this sphere the block sphere. And this point, <laughs> all right, I don't know. Okay, we're back square on, okay, so I have to log in. I don't know what this is. I'm not going to go through the... Uh, okay. Sorry. Okay, so maybe I have to... Okay, so here is the what we call the block sphere, and every point on the sphere of unit length, the ve you have vectors of unit length, and every point is a potential state of a qubit. And so here we can characterize the qubit by two angles, theta and phi, and in quantum language we can also represent it this way. And the north pole is the state zero, the south pole is the state one. And what we want is we want to keep it where somewhere, you know, on this block sphere, so we have some point there, we want to keep it there, right? But noise will let it drift or let it do, you know, have small rotations, and that's, that's, that's our problem, basically. So small variations of this point in this block sphere will immediately lead to loss of functionality, I have to say. All right, um, and we also want to manipulate this qubit in the block sphere. For example, we want to do something like a pi over two rotation, so rotating zero to the equator, for example, or rotating the state in the equator um, around. And those operations are, you know, what we say logical gates that we do on single qubits. And in order to build a quantum computer, we have to do these gates very reliably on single qubits. And then we also have to take multiple of these sort of balls and entangle them. Yeah, so we have multiple qubits, and we need to do gates like the controlled not gate. The controlled not gate is very simple. So if one qubit is in one, you flip the other qubit. If one qubit is the same qubit is in zero, you don't flip the other qubit. So that's just a classical gate. We have to do it on vectors that are described, that are superpositions of zeros and ones. Right? And so the point right where we're at right now is that um, if we think about our physical qubits, now, this is not a physical qubit, it's just a representation, a mathematical representation of a physical qubit, that we have noise sources that lead to error rates which are 1%, 0.1%, per component at best. So basically, if I do a C0 gate, I would have an error rate of 1% or a little less. If I let the qubit idle for some period, I'd have this error rate. You know, if I do a measurement on the qubit, I have this error rate. And um, you know, and this is what we want. We want these error rates to go to like 10 to the minus 15 or so. And there's no physical system which this sort of naturally will come about. Or it would be very hard to design such a system. And so that is what I mean by we have qubits which are very different from our paperclip. Um, um, and we need to design better qubits that uh, have a sort of built-in robustness. All right. And so as I said, we have to really start from scratch. And I, so, so in that sense, we shouldn't be impatient thinking that, um, you know, this should come out very soon uh, because what you can see, I would say, for the last 30 years, we've built uh, a beautiful theory of quantum error correction. And uh, at the same time, people have built physical qubits that now have these error rates of 1% or 0.1%, which is already very, very impressive. So in some sense, I would say experimentally, we've gone from the situation of like, no life to bacteria. But on the other hand, you could say, well, bacterium doesn't look like a human being, which would be sort of the end point of the you know, digital quantum computer. So we've made great strides, but there's still a lot to come, particularly to show that this quantum, this theory that we've built is actually useful for building better, you know, logical qubits. So what I want to do in my talk is, is kind of give you a little bit of the basics of this theory and then talk about the experimental situation. And there you see there's some friction in terms of, um, well, what are the challenges that we have to overcome. All right, so the idea is of error correct, quantum error correction is actually very similar as just classical error correction. Like if my, my silly computation that I'm very bad at doing uh, you know, arithmetic, I just do the computation three times in parallel and I take the majority of answers. 
So the basic idea is the same, except uh, it's not so simple. Because uh, first of all, I don't just have, you know, if I write everything in terms of uh, bits or Kyonghwan bits, I just don't have only bit flip errors. I have also some different type of error, which is a phase flip error. And secondly, this idea of just, you know, doing everything, you know, 10 times over uh, is, is too simplistic. Okay, so, but what we do have is we have this thing about reducing redundancy. So what we do is we use n physical qubits, n could be seven or nine or, you know, 300, and we have different codes for which this number n is different. And uh, we use them to represent one better logical qubit. Right, and what we want, we want to do operations on the logical qubit like we've done in this physical qubit, and we have to argue how we're doing this exactly. Uh, Jesus, I'm really unlucky with the technical details. <laughs> All right, so this doesn't fit so well. Okay, yes, okay, it's still a bit unstable. All right, so, so, you know, mathematically what happens is if I have n physical qubits, I have a 2 to the n dimensional vector space, and I'm going to just going to choose a two-dimensional subspace in there to put my qubit. So in this two-dimensional subspace, I have a basis, one vector I call zero, the other vector I call one, and I want to be able to, you know, create any state in the subspace. And the, my choice of the subspace should be such that the likely errors that are happening they shouldn't be moving, you know, the vector in the subspace around. Rather, they should be mapping this vector from the subspace outside of it. In a way, in a very particular way, in a way that I can reverse the error, right? So what I want the error to do is that maybe I it maps it outside the subspace, but there should be a way of mapping me back into the subspace and I should be coming back to the same point, right? So that looks not so easy, not so, it's not, not any subspace, will be good because the error, and, but it has to depend on the, you know, the structure of the likely errors, basically. And it should also be something where if I want to do the reversal, I should be, I could be doing this by, say, measuring whether I'm outside the subspace and where am I outside the subspace, and then saying, okay, if I'm there, um, I, you know, this is how I sort of do the correction, right? So there's components like I do a measurement about, you know, where I am, and then I have to do some processing of this measurement, which is called decoding, which determines which, you know, error I think has, should have happened. Um, yes, so that's, that's basically sort of the uh, very overall. But then you can say, well, you know, two-dimensional subspace, that's not, how can I efficiently describe this? So there's a beautiful formalism of, of codes, of stabilizer codes that has been developed that allows us to describe this the subspace that I want to use very efficiently. All right, now, what a little bit about the errors. So actually, I don't need to have errors that map me out this subspace. It could be a superposition of being in and out. So with some amplitude, I stay in. With some amplitude, I move out. Oh, geez, this thing is messed up again. Maybe I should just hold this. Okay. All right, so um, in principle, the errors that I have on physical qubits, they'll be continuous in the sense they'll be, you know, this point on the block sphere will be slightly changing. But maybe you can understand that, you know, if you do rotations on this sphere, there are only two, you know, independent axes of rotation. So the generators of these changes are only two different directions. For example, for example, I could be using the X and Z axis. Uh, so I could, you know, I can get any rotation out of a rotation around the X and the Z axis. Um, and so this leads to the fact, I don't know what is going on today. Okay. okay, slight break. I have to have my computer go to the IT. This is falling asleep. All right, so we're good for another five minutes and then <laughs> we have another <laughs> event like this. So in some sense, the errors seem continuous, but they're actually are discrete because they're generated by errors along, you know, two different axes, namely the X and the Z axis. And another way of saying this, if I have, uh, you know, these, these errors, the bit flip error is a two by two matrix, the Z, the, the Z error is a two by two matrix, the product of them is another two by two matrix, the Y error, and any Hermitian matrix 
you know, two, you know, two by two matrix can be written as a linear combination of these matrices. So they generate uh, the possible changes that can happen to the, the qubit. Now the important thing, of course, is that if I have classical information, I only care about bit flips, but if I have quantum information, I also care about phase flips. Uh, so what this phase flip, the Z operation does, it maps Z, uh, is maps one onto minus one. And if I only work with bits, I'd never see this minus one. But if I have a state which is a superposition of zero and one, it would be mapped to a superposition of zero and minus one, right? So it's see these phases. And so there's sort of double trouble. And you know, this double trouble is also one of the causes why quantum error correction is intrinsically harder than classical error correction, why we can tolerate less noise, and, and, and some features which would sort of, you know, would show that, you know, it may take a little longer to get the quantum error correction to work in practice, right? And so here, this point, the point I want to say here is basically that if I just use um, simple classical error correction code, like the repetition code, so instead of a zero one, I have, you know, n zeros or n ones, that of course, you know, if I take majority votes, if the half of them or less than half of them flip, I can correct it. But that idea won't work if I'm going to put the zero and one in superposition. So if I want to preserve a superposition of zero and one, that works fine with bit flip errors, but with phase flip errors, this type of state is immediately with a single phase flip goes to this state because I can put Z on any of these qubits and um, it will become this other logical state. And so we really need to invent quantum error correction codes, and these have been invented, to, to deal with this double trouble of x correcting x and z errors. The other effect, or the other feature, is that you have to, um, you know, so if, so if you have classical memory, you can say, okay, some bits have flipped, I measure every bit, see if it's zero and one, and see, you know, what the majority of the values is, but you can't do that with quantum information. You can't, if you're gonna measure your, your logical qubit, you measure every qubit in the zero one basis, you also lose your information. So what you want actually, you want to do some measurement that tell you whether you're outside this code space, outside of two dimensional space, without telling where you are, where you were in this two dimensional space, right? So no logical information should be revealed by the measurement, otherwise there's sort of a collapse of the wave function, but there should be full information about um, you know, how, what, how far or how, in what extent you're outside this code space. And for that, we use some extra qubits typically. These are called ancilla or measure qubits. And so if we think about overhead, so we encode one qubit maybe in, into nine, but then we need a bunch like say eight ancilla qubits to measure, okay, there we go again, to measure the, the errors. Okay, sorry, this gets too annoying for you, but. For the moment, I can't do anything. Right. I think I just have to keep on, you know, activating these slides or something more readily. Okay. So, um, okay. I have to turn my take my glasses off. Okay. So, so we need extra qubits, which adds to the overhead, which is not ideal. Another feature of, of, of quantum error correction, which makes it less trivial, um, relates to this idea of, um, well, transversal or blockwise. So if I use the repetition code, or I just, you know, do my classical computation, you know, three times on three copies of all the bits that I used to have, you know, it's clear that, uh, you know, if I do this in parallel, the depth of the circuit is the same. I, there's, there's just this copy overhead, but nothing else. And that type of way of, in, uh, you know, doing gates we call transversal or blockwise. And here you see an example. So for example, I had to do a single qubit gate on a single qubit. And now instead I have like seven qubits. And now in order to do this gate on the, at the logical level on the, the single qubit encoded by these seven, I just do gates on every one of them. So that's a very efficient, nice way of doing it. It's called transversal, but not all goats, there are theorems that say that not all gates can be done transversely, and we need constructions that look more complicated, like this, and that are then more prone to errors. Okay, so that's another issue where um, quantum error correction, um, yeah, is more complicated, simply. So the opposite of these considerations is that for quantum error correction, we require fairly low error rates. So what Nicolas Delfos also said in his lecture, if you were present, 
is that sort of the best error correction codes, they work if the error rate per component is 1% or less. Uh, it's more like close to 0.75%. And we're not there quite yet experimentally at these low error rates. All right, so now I want to say something about surface codes because, um, because what? Because they're the most favorite type of way of, of doing error correction in the very short term. Um, and also because they uh, lead into me talking a little bit about topology and about some extensions of surface codes that may be of interest to you if you like polyhedra. Okay, so that's just, yeah, yeah. 0.75% looks like an error rate that is achievable today. Uh, is the yeah. Issue, is the issue that, that, that you need such enormous overhead that it's not practical? Um, yeah, well, okay, I would say it is hard to achieve that error rate. It's not completely, no, no, okay, we're close, but okay, and then you have to maintain that error rate if you have many more qubits, right? Yeah. So, so, and also over many days and many, you know, there are sort of caveats. It's not a crazy error rate, because in early fault tolerance, okay, I have to stand here for the recording. In, in, in earlier work, we were talking about error rates of 10 to minus fifth, five, which is a lot lower. Uh, so this is, uh, this is not so bad. It's not crazy to think about this. Yeah. And there is continued pro progress towards these low, you know, lowering error rates per component. Um, yes. And is this actually with practical overhead? This threshold that you're quoting? This 0.75? Yeah. What, what do you mean with practical? Like, like the number of physical qubits per logical qubit. Like, like what would that be? No, 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 but this is just for the surface code, it's 0.75, okay. right? So that's not an eff very efficient code in terms of the overhead, uh, but it is a code that has a fairly high threshold. The point is that, um, you know, if you come up, there are other codes that may have higher thresholds, but they are not so embeddable in two dimensions on chips and so on, yep. right? So it's kind of surprising that, um, yeah, we, okay, so l let me get back to, let me go to the surface code ex explanation. So a surface code is a family of codes. So this number n, you know, one into n is varying. So n can be nine or it can be 25 or 49. And so the idea is that the more redundancy, so the higher n is, we hope to achieve a better logical qubit. Huh? So if we do operations with logical qubits, they'll be less prone to errors and this should scale exponentially in, in the square root of n actually. All right, okay. Four minutes. <laughs> All right, so probably set to some, uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, indeed, that is better. Maybe I need an assistant to, to, to. okay. Yeah, okay. Yeah, Scott shouldn't have asked this question. That's really screwed up. <laughs> All right, okay, glasses off. All right, so we have, uh, so, so let's look at how we describe these codes. All right, so if you've seen surface code, this is not, no, you know, it's not very new. So, okay, so what we have here is actually nine qubits and they live at the vertices of this lattice, uh, three by three lattice, and you see these black squares and these white stairs. And what do they mean? So the nice thing about these types of codes is that we specify this two-dimensional subspace out of this two to the nine-dimensional subspace very efficiently. Namely, we say that these qubits have to obey some parity checks. And let's look and what, what these parity checks look like. For example, these four qubits, and that's denoted by this white square, their parity should be even, right? And they say, well, what's the operator that measures parity? Well, for qubits, this turns out the product of the poly z's on those four qubits. And similarly, the parity of these two qubits should also be even for the qubits, for the, you know, the, the, the vector, the qubit vector to be in the code space, eh, in this two-dimensional space. Now, you see also there's some black squares, and these black squares essentially do the same, same thing as the, the, you know, the z squares, except they do this in this rotated basis. Remember the, the block sphere, you have a z axis, and there is an x-axis like this, and there is a rotation that relates the two. So you just can think about the, what we call the x-check is like a parity in a rotated basis where every qubit is going to the rotated basis. And the nice thing is that these as operators uh, acting on multiple qubits, they actually commute. That's to say this block, uh, this, these, this poly, you know, this parity check 
on those four qubits commutes with disparity check on these four qubits because they actually overlap on two qubits, namely these two, you know, these two here. All right, so the code space, this two-dimensional vector space, is the uh, space where all the parity checks have eigenvalue plus one. And so the thing to do to determine whether you're outside the code space is to measure the parity checks. And you do that using some ancilla qubits. And the nice thing about this is that you can place these ancilla qubits that have to interact with the data qubits to measure the parity checks. You can place them in between these, you know, these qubits at these vertices that are not, not shown. But so you can have a 2D plane or connectivity between qubits, and this is nice for chip design, as you'll see a little bit later in the slides. Okay, so the disadvantage of some, so we, what we want is we kind of say, okay, oh yeah. so what we want perhaps is not to encode one qubit into nine, but maybe one qubit into a thousand or 10,000, which is huge, of course, and we're not there. We're now at the level of encoding one qubit into nine or one qubit into 25. All right, so how does the error correction then proceed? Okay, so now these open dots are the ancilla qubits. So for every parity check, I've placed an ancilla qubit in the middle of this check. So for example, this qubit should be interacting with these two and extract the parity of these two bits or qubits. But the, gate, the circuit I would do would be the same as if I just extract the parity of these two bits. Okay, so now without showing you how this actually works, these circuits that extract the parities are of this form. For example, to extract the, you know, what, let's say I have this, this X check on these four qubits, I have to run a circuit where this open dot here is this qubit. I prepare it in a plus state, and I do a bunch of C naughts. I do some other things, and I, I, I measure it. And the idea now is that if a Z error happens on any of these four input qubits, it will flip the outcome of the measurement. Right? So the error gets detected, but the error doesn't, you know, the, the outcome of the measurement doesn't quite tell which qubit undergone an error, underwent an error. Uh, and, and so I have to combine information from this, you know, measurement and that measurement, all these measurements, to infer what errors have happened. There's a similar circuit for the, to measuring the z-checks, and those z-checks, for example, these four qubits, if there's an x error on any of those four, then it will flip the outcome of these measurements. So we call a quantum error correction cycle the execution of these circuits sort of as parallelized as possible for all these checks of the surface code, right? I'm not showing you why this works this way. If you've seen it before, then, then you probably understand. If you haven't, then you just have to trust me here. All right, so what, we ha what happens actually is something like this. Let's say there is an X error that's happened on this qubit in the code space. I, I don't care where it is in the code space, but just a poly error, X error, so this bit is sort of flipped, if it were a bit. And this X error will be detected by these two Z checks because it will flip the parity of this group and the parity of this group. And so that's why there are two blue dots here. And simpler, similarly, if there's an X error here, I will see some effect here. If there's a Z error here, I'll see some effect there, etc. So the information I will get are these blue dots. And I'll do this type of measurement over and over again, so I'd get these collections of blue dots, and then I have to say, well, what errors have happened? And of course, these parity check circuits are also executed with the same noisy gates. Huh? These C not gates are noisy and imperfect, the measurement's imperfect. So, um, you know, I don't always get the, the measurement that corresponds to the actual error. I may get measurements that I can't completely trust. So this, the task of what we call the decoder is to actually figure out what the actual errors were. Okay, so now the thing that, so this code, this, uh, this uh, surface code, this little surface code can correct a single error. So the claim is that I've had a single error on any of the nine qubits, could be an X or a Z error, I can correct it. And you can understand this as that the single errors, they lead to sort of distinct patterns of, 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 of blue dots, so that I can say, hey, it's this, or hey, it's that. And sometimes there's some ambiguity, but we don't, some ambiguities we don't care about, but we do care about this type of ambiguity. Of course, for example, it could be that there's an X error here in the middle, would have these two blue dots, but that same blue dots would be caused by a pair of X error, one here and one there. Yeah, because this X error flips the parity here and this X error flips the parity there. So I wouldn't be able to tell the difference between this or that, the same, the same blue dots. So if, if, 
a single qubit x error would be equally likely as this thing, I'm kind of lost, right? Because I don't know what to choose for. So we say this code can correct only a single qubit error. And what we do is we always choose a single qubit error as, you know, the error that we think will have happened. But that means that if a two qubit error has happened, which we consider less likely, we will we'll make a logical error. Basically, what we have then, let's say, um, a two qubit error happens like this one, and I'm inferring this one. So effectively, all these three qubits have flipped. And the, all these three qubit flipping is actually what we call a logical error. Yep. So, so I haven't actually mentioned what logical operations are in this, in this code thing. So if we say we have the surface code, I say there's this two-dimensional subspace I have to specify, and I can specify, you know, when I'm in the space, I have to obey these parity checks. But I can also say, well, what's the, what's the state zero in the space? And what's the state one? And what's the operation for, for me to get from zero to one? Yeah, so the operation from zero to one is what I call the logical x, because it's the logical bit flip that flips the logical bit from zero to one. And there's similarly what we call logical z, which flips the logical qubit plus to minus and vice versa. Yeah, so important feature of the code is, um, is are these logical operations. Okay. So, okay, so that was sort of my intro a little bit in the surface code, and we'll see this come back, because now we're later in the talk, we're gonna get so you see some, um, some chips that are trying to implement the surface code. But just as a general consideration, you know, there are many, many code families, and the surface code is only the tip of the surface. Uh, the surface code was actually introduced by Kitaev, not as the surface code, but first as the toric code, and it had a deep connection with topology. And actually, we should look at this torus. Yeah? So the idea is to define a toric code. What we do is we, we tile the torus with some square lattice, like in this picture, and then we put qubits on the edges. So physical qubits are on the edges. Of course, I can have a very ti fine tiling or less fine tiling, and that sets this N of the encoding. And then what we have, we'll have checks that correspond to the faces. So every face will correspond to a Z check. So all the edges around, is, around the face will be, ha you know, have, have to have even parity. And with every vertex, we also associate, I have to do this, uh, with every vertex, I also have to, I'm also associating a check, and that is an X check. So if I have a vertex, there will be four edges coming out of this vertex, and uh, I, I do an X check on every one of those four checks. Again, these, these, these checks commute, and um, then the thing is that why this is an interesting code is because actually this code, the information uh, that is encoded relates to the topology, right? The topology of a torus. Well, there are new two non-trivial loops, right? And the point is that each non-trivial loop corresponds to the logical operation of a qubit. So this code encodes two logical qubits, and one logical uh, operation runs like this, and the other logical operation runs like that. And you can clearly see if you take this tiling to be finer and finer, then the number of you know, edges or the number of qubits that this logical operation goes through gets more and more and more, which means that the logical operating, you know, gets longer, and the longer, the larger, the, you know, so the, the more qubits the logical operation touches, you know, the better protection you have, right? Because, you know, sort of the, you want to avoid that errors cause the logical operations. All right, so you can do this, but then you can also move away from this. You can say, well, um, I can, instead of taking a square tiling, I could be trying to tile with pentagons. Here you see some pentagon. It doesn't matter the shape here, because this is some representation of the hyperbolic plane. But what the feature here is that you have five pentagons coming, you know, together at one uh, vertex. And again, you can say, I'm going to put edges, I can put qubit on the edges here. And for every pentagon, I have a parity check that acts on the five edges. And for every vertex, I have a parity check that acts like ik, x on the five you know, emanating edges. And again, these commute. And now the point is that um, you know, if I just tile, um, you know, if I try to tile the you know, flat plane with these pentagons, 
it doesn't work. The, you know, if I do that with pieces of paper, which are you know little you know pentagon-shaped papers, um, um, uh, the paper will start to crumble because I can't you know get the angles to to add up um, correctly. And so this is why this is a tiling of the hyperbolic plane. And um, but I, I could be sort of tiling this, but then in the end, I'd like to have some closed manifold. So here, like you know, for the torus, I want to actually sort of you know have boundaries here. Uh, sorry, sorry, add, um, you know, identify edges here at the boundary so that I close this. And then what I get is actually something like this. It's a many-handle torus. And then for actually for every hole, you will have two qubits like what you have here. Now, why is this actually interesting? So why you could do the same thing. You could also tile this with the square tiling. Why would you do this with these tiles with uh, pentagons? It turns out that because of the hyperbolic geometry, you get codes that can correct, that are much more efficient in terms of overhead. So I've been talking about encoding one into n, you know, one logical qubit into n qubits. That's what the surface code does. The Tor code, I encode two into n. But I could also try to encode k qubits into n. Let me just switch this. k qubits into n. And I'll try to, you know, make k as high as possible. So I want to have the least, you know, n sort of as small as possible, and to get the best possible performance. OK, so just as an example, so we've examined some of this. So these codes are called hyperbolic surface codes, and they are sort of the smallest sort of departures from the, surface from the, the actual surface code in the sense that I can almost, you know, for a finite code of finite n, in which this sort of, you know, ends at some point, and I have to have these you know, sort of, these, you know, identify these boundaries, that's fairly non-local. But other than that, I can almost sort of represent it in two dimensions. You know, not quite, but um, still it's not completely crazy. And actually it turns out that the smallest, one of the smallest of these codes uh, is related to the stellated dodecahedron as, as a top large, as a polyhedron. So let me say one thing about that. So, you know, I said we tile a torus and um, Every face becomes a z-check and every vertex associate an x-check. But I could also be tiling one of the platonic solids. But of course, like a dodecahedron. But this is a topologically trivial figure. And therefore, I'll actually encode no logical information. But I could be defining something. I say, OK, every face is a pentagon, so I put qubits on the edges. And every face is a pentagon, so I have a, a z-check. So this should be five z's, actually. Um, a Z check with every face and with every vertex, which acts on you know three edges, I have an X check. But because this is topologically trivial, I have no encoded information. And then um, I think actually in the Renaissance, people uh, you know looked also at what was called the stellated dodecahedron, and the stellated dodecahedron is obtained by taking the dodecahedron and just extending the edges such that they meet at a point. So I'm sending this edge out and this edge out, you know, and these, this edge, and then and this edge, and then they'll come to a point like this here. So the core of this figure is like the dodecahedron, but then it has this stellation. And now I'm associating actually, now this is a vertex of my code, and I'm going to associate a, an, an X check with that. So previously I had an you know, X check associated with this vertex, but now I'm generating a new figure, and with every vertex of this stellated figure, this thing is also running out of battery. Okay, so great. Do this. <laughs> All right, so, so with every vertex I associate an X check, and that acts on the five vertices that are coming out of this, five edges that are coming out of this vertex. And the original faces of my dodecahedron code will actually be remain because I'm still putting a qubit on this um, is extended edge. Yeah, and this is now, Jesus, this is really, okay, so this is not working. I guess, I don't know. Should I, should I put this? You have another one? I guess it just needs, okay. Okay, yeah, 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 fine, thanks, yeah. All right, thanks. Um, all right, and uh, the, the, okay, the point about this is actually the, 
It has, you know, you wouldn't think this, that this figure has non-trivial genus. It actually has genus four, and it encodes eight logical qubits, so two per hole. Uh, and this was, and it, this comes about, it's not, you know, the thing is that this, you know, this has normal faces, but this actually has a very funny face because one, you know, face is like the original face of this dodecahedron, but now this becomes like this, 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 this. Those are the edges of the face. It becomes sort of a twisted face. And this is why this can have sort of non-trivial topology. You can look at many more polyhedra, and you can say, oh, this is a code that encodes this many qubits, and it, I have to do these parity checks and so on. So these are nice, you know, you could say it's sort of a game, because I haven't seen anybody interested in, uh, you know, representing or realizing this code, unfortunately. But it is a code that is very efficient, because, you know, I have, this has 30 edges, so I start with n is 30, and I'm encoding eight logical qubits, and this code can, uh, you know, correct a single error. So in some sense, it's a lot more efficient as a code than the surface code. Now, you can see this figure is not necessarily embeddable in 2D, especially if you take these hyperbolic surface code, you make them much larger, they become harder to embed. Um, but, you know, it's still, I, I don't think it's sort of an entirely no-go compared to other code constructions that we know. All right, so I don't know how I'm doing on time, but now I want to switch. So this was my intro, a little bit in the theory and making some connection with topology. And now I want to talk a bit about um, the experimental issues, and I'm going to illustrate that by my favorite platform, which is superconducting transmont qubits. Uh, just explaining a little bit, you know, what errors come about or what they look like in practice, because this is slightly a different story. Okay, so a lot of people actually, con you know, worry or, or complain about overheads. So the surface code has a large overhead. I need to make a lot of qubits. Now, this in some sense is an understandable point. On the other hand, the point is really that we're trying to do things with classical control and classical hardware or electronics that is sort of old school. And the point I want to make is that I feel the field of quantum computing, um, you know, in order to realize its potential, it needs a lot of classical engineering development. It's nothing so much to do with, with quantum coherence or something, but it, it, it's, you know, now you, they take things off the shelf, but they need to develop these further. Of course, as a mathematician or theorist, this is not an area where you can help necessarily, but it is important to realize, right? So if you take a transistor, like a MOSFET, you say, okay, there is some charge on a capacitor. How many electrons are there? Well, you know, there are gazillions of electrons, but of course I don't have to control them individually. You say, well, there's a huge overhead of electrons. Well, nobody would ever say this because you don't have to control them individually. The point of qubits is that you do need individual control because you need to do individual measurement of qubits and these physical qubits that are used for the surface code, you need to individually measure them or typically this is what people do. And you need to, um, you know, they do single qubit gates and some controlled not gates and so on. And that's where the real overhead is. All right, so meet, meet a qubit is called the transmon. All right, now a transmon is actually not a very complicated qubit. Well, because what we can think about is a, l a lot of physical systems uh, are described by oscillators, right? If we have a pendulum in a gravitational field, um, this is a slightly anharmonic oscillator. You can, write, you can describe it classically, and of course, if there's very little friction, the pendulum keeps on swimming, uh, swinging. Um, we can quantize the pendulum, and of course, then there will be discrete energy levels, and there will not just be two of them, but there will be an infinite number of them, and if the, the pendulum is um, you know, uh, approximated as a harmonic oscillator, all these levels will be equidistant. Uh, and so these levels are depicted like this. So the lowest level we may call zero, as the, the state zero of my qubit, the first one we call one, and the, but then there's two and there's three. And in this diagram, you see something that's not a harmonic oscillator, but an anharmonic oscillator. And we do like a system to be anharmonic because what we want is we want a qubit. We don't want a system with many, many energy levels. And the problem is when we drive when we sort of, you know, this is the picture of driving. So, for example, you want to do gates which, which map zero onto one. 
we don't want to inadvertently excite these higher energy levels. And when these energy levels are equidistant, we cannot actually avoid this very easily. So the transmon is sort of like this, you know, anharmonic pendulum. Actually, the equations, classical equation motions are ex exactly the same, but it's realized as an electric circuit or an approximate electric circuit. So there is a, you know, electric an analogy of a harmonic oscillator in which kinetic energy gets converted to potential energy and vice versa. And that is the system where magnetic energy gets converted to electrical energy and vice versa. And that is an LC oscillator. All right, so a transmon qubit is sort of an LC oscillator. And the first thing is that there is a capacitor. So what's a capacitor? Just two large plates, which are usually, you know, metal plates. But in our case, we actually work, you know, at metal plates, which are at, uh, at the very low temperature and they're superconducting. So here you see two structures and they form a capacitor. Um, and then besides this, I have to have this L term, which is the inductor. And the inductor is a bit of a funny element because these are two superconductors. And here is a very, very tiny structure. So these two per superconductors almost touch, but there is a very small oxide in between them. Um, and what can happen is that pairs of electrons can kind of tunnel from one superconductor from one of these plates to the other plates. And the description of that, or that element, is called a Josephson junction. It's very hard to make these Josephson junctions very precise because this oxide they have to put down is nanometers thick. And if you do it slightly thicker, it changes the qubit. It changes the qubit frequency. It changes the, you know, the, the energy between, the di difference between levels one, it changes other features of this qubit. So we have to operate this qubit at very low temperatures because we work with a superconductor. So this is operated in a special fridge, so called a dilution fridge, at order 10 millikelvin. All right, so, so what are the errors on the qubit? So I've talked about bit flip and phase flip errors. Now that it, that it's true that any error can be decomposed into those, or the, you know, and the products of those, but physically, the errors have a different origin. So the first point is that if you look at this qubit on the block sphere, so it's a point, but it's actually not sitting still. If I leave this qubit alone, and let's say it's very coherent, this vector is rotating. It's called precession on the block sphere. And, you know, I'm assuming, you know, in my, if I want to do, you know, if I want to run some circuit, I'm assuming that if I don't do a gate, the qubit's sitting still, right? Now, fortunately, um, if, I, if this qubit is processing like this around the z-axis, the probability that I measure to be zero or one is not changed. It doesn't matter whether I'm here or there, as long as my projection onto this z-axis is the same. Right, so it's not sitting still, but let's say, say the, 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 you know, the frequency at which it's moving, that is related to the energy difference between zero and one, what I just showed. And that's the characteristic frequency of the qubit, or if I have an oscillator, it's just the, you know, the frequency in which I have oscillations. That's what it relates to. Now, if this frequency is slightly wobbly, it changes in time, then I don't know where this qubit is anymore, right? Is it there? Is it there? Because sometimes they move too faster than others. That process is called dephasing, and there's a characteristic time in which I kind of lose completely where I am eh, in this sort of plane. Like, am I here? Am I there? I don't know. So that for a transmon is happening in order 10 microseconds, right? 10 to, my, 10 to minus five seconds. Looks like a very short time, but of course we have to compare this with how fast we're actually doing operations on this qubit. Okay, so let me just do that. And okay. So that is loss of phase information because we say that there is a phase which says, you know, how, where I am in this plane, which is this phase, exactly. Now, there's another mechanism that the qubit is subject to, which is um, energy exchange with other systems. So I said that this point zero has different energy, has a different energy level, is lower in energy than this one. And I'm sort of embedded in a very low temperature environment, which means that one is more likely to sort of drop down to zero and emit, uh, you know, emit a photon to the environment than the other process. And this type of process in which, you know, I exchange energy with 
the environment, which could be very general. There are many sort of mechanisms that contribute to it. Sometimes it's hard to figure out you know, what does what. But it causes some relaxation time called T1. And so this T1 is sort of a measure of like, if I were to prepare this qubit in one and I wait for a while, you know, what's the characteristic time in which I'll just find it in zero? Because these qubits, they live at a very low temperature, so they'd much like to be, you know, in their steady state, they're much more like, likely to be in zero, right? So if I put them all in one, then they'll sort of fall down to zero. This happens at a time also similar, you know, order tens microseconds, and we're trying to stretch this, so there are possibilities to lengthen this time, yeah, also this time. So one of the advances that has to happen or is happening is that we can lengthen these times of the qubit sort of falling apart without me doing anything to it, right? That's the first step. Then, of course, I want to do gates. I want to manipulate the qubit. So, for example, I want to drive it from zero to one, or I want to do this sort of pi over two pulse in the, on the block sphere. So, go, you know, make this trajectory from zero to the, the equator, or from zero all the way to one. So, the way I do that is by, you know, um, applying. Uh, microwaves, because why microwaves? Well, it turns out that this energy difference between zero and one is exactly uh, in a microwave regime, so five gigahertz. Yeah, so this is a Wi-Fi frequency. And so you say, well, I could get a coax cable and I you know, put my microwaves in. Now, this doesn't happen at room temperature and it doesn't happen like in a regular microwave that you at home at that you know, high intensity. The number of photons you know, you, you, you sort of, you know, you, 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 you um, subject this qubit to is very, very low. Yeah, so you generate the signal at room temperature and then it's very much attenuated, goes into this fridge, and then there it manipulates this, this qubit and does this rotation. Or half, you know, this rotation, or if you run it a little longer, this is full rotation. Yeah, so you manipulate the qubit with microwaves resonant with this characteristic frequency, and then you can do these rotation in order 10 nanoseconds gate time. So that's good, nanoseconds 10 to minus nine, so that's a thousand times faster than these coherence time. So I can kind of do a thousand of these things before the qubit falls apart, right? That's where this error rate of 10 to the minus three is coming from, essentially. Yeah, so that's not bad. And the thing we all want to do, which I mentioned before, because there are higher levels, there's zero, one, and there's also two. We don't want these microwaves to excite these higher levels. We call this leakage, and we have to deal with that in error correction. Okay, so the other thing we want to do is we want to take these two qubits, you know, two qubits on a chip, and we want to do controlled not gates. Now in practice for these transmon qubits, people often like to do control Z gates. So a control Z gates, the mechanism is essentially is that um, depending on the state of one qubit, whether it's zero or one, it changes the energy difference between zero and one of the other qubits. Uh, and that's the, the sort of the, we invoke this sort of mechanism as the way to do this gate. Okay, so I'm not going to explain to you how to do this, but this also has a order 50 nanosecond gate time. So again, pretty fast. So that's all good. The measurement of a qubit in this platform turns out to be more involved and actually intrinsically take longer. So you see here, this is an order of 10, a factor 10 longer um, than these uh, single qubit and two qubit gate times. And this means that while some qubits are being measured, other qubits have to wait a long time, right? So for example, in these, you know, if I do quantum error correction, I have to measure ancilla qubits to determine, you know, whether errors have taken place. And while I'm doing that, I have to, you know, do that in a time slot like this. And my actual qubits that, that are used to represent my logical qubit, they're sort of falling apart. Well, you know, not literally, this is still shorter than, you know, uh, this is not, you know, microseconds, but um, it's, it's fairly long. And, um, and actually, if you, if you look at this measurement, so this is a fairly non-trivial process, which uses another resonator, and you actually probe with, also with microwave, that resonator, and the, the frequency of that resonator is changed depending on the state of this qubit. And, and that frequency change is what you actually pick up, so it's quite indirect. And then you get data points like, you know, these blue or red or black points. And this is sort of points that you get from when the qubit is in zero, one, and two. And, you know, you get one of sample out of this sort of Gaussian looking distribution or this one. 
And then, you know, when you're in the blue region, say, oh, I call it a zero. When you're in the red region, I call it a one. And of course, there's some error that you incur by doing this, besides from, you know, it being a fairly lengthy operation. All right. <coughs> so Scott also referred to overhead. And now let's look at something. So this is a picture of a chip. It's so of course just a schematic. There's a size here, it's one millimeter. And these Pac-Man-like things are actually representing transmon qubits. And so what this is, is actually a chip that's used for an experiment that I was involved in uh, by the Di Carlo lab at QTech on seven uh, qubits. So, and out of these seven, I have four qubits that are representing my code. So I'm coding one qubit in four. And this is a code that can detect one error. It cannot correct it. For that, I would need to encode one into nine, the next bigger surface code that can detect one error. And this error detection takes place using these three ancilla qubits. So these are A1, A2, and A3. So in this picture, I can identify here A3, A2, A1, and then there's D1, D2, D3, D4. And these Pac-Man things, you see kind of, you know, the two capacitor plates are, this, you know, two parts of these things. But then there's a lot of infrastructure on this chip. And there's a, there's a legend here that says all that, what's going on. And let's look at that a little bit to understand the overhead. So orange, if you can see this, this is what's called a drive line. So it's like an in-plane coax cable through which you send microwaves at very low amplitude. And every qubit has its own drive line. Like here there's an orange line to go to this one. There's an orange line that goes to this one. There's an orange line that goes to this one. So, you know, if you imagine that the chip is bigger and everybody has to have a drive line, you can't get these drive lines all on the side of the chip. You have to do something from, three from, from the third dimension, which is what companies like IBM and Google have already figured out and we at Delft are still you know, struggling with, so to say. Okay, so much that is just, you have these drive lines because you wanna do some single qubit rotations. Actually, in this experiment, in some sense you don't need it, well, for some things you don't need it, but okay, you need, it's nice to have this control. Okay, but then there's also something that you probably can't read, but it's called a flux line. Let me just do this. Okay, a flux line. And those are the yellow things. Again, they come from the side. And these are lines that are actually used to send in some current. And this current creates a magnetic flux through a little loop in this superconducting structure that's the qubit. And effectively, it changes the frequency of the qubit. <coughs> Now, why do you change the frequency of the qubit? This is actually indirectly a mechanism to do the control Z gate. All right, okay, so fine, we need this too. Maybe this is, we're not gonna understand entirely how this works. Then there are structures called coupling bus. So these qubits, for example, qubit, ancilla qubit A2 needs to do a control Z gate with ancilla qubit, or with data qubit D2. So here we have A2, here we have D2, and there is a coupling bus, which is also a piece of sort of, um, well, it's a, it's a resonator, but there's a structure that goes in between, and that enables you to do a control Z gate, right? And you actually, well, if you'd studied this thing, you'd see that between D2 and D4, there is no, well, actually this has some direct coupling, but it is not necessary. So only the ancilla qubits have to talk with the data qubits to do the gates. All right, what else do we have? Well, we have what's called a feed line. And these are also, again, microwave lines that are used to do readouts. So I think I mentioned readout as we need some other resonators, which are in pink, and there are structures like here, and they're next to the qubit. So every qubit has another structure, and these structures are probed, they're resonators, with the characteristic frequency and their pro and their, their, their characteristic frequency is changed by the qubit state and they're probed again by microwaves. All right, so this, this is chip looks complicated, but it's, you know, you say, well, there's many lines. Where do all these lines go, right? In the end, well, here you see a picture. These are lots of lines that then come out of this chip. And this is, um, this is what you, you know, the chip is somewhere in here and these are all these cables that you need to sort of do all this massive um, control. Right, so you see here the issue is, you know, this classical control and overhead 
it's definitely you know a challenge when scaling up. So this is this this is the overhead for like for the, the Google's experiment with 49 qubits. All right. Now if we look at the far future, what we would need, and these are estimates for like if you want to run a computation that factors a large, we would need 20 million noisy qubits. Right? So this looks kind of crazy if you see already the complication of this chip. So IBM has far you know, reaching plans, and other companies maybe too, to actually have this come about, but this is clearly you know, far in the future. How am I doing on time? I have to, okay, close to, yeah, yeah. All right, now um, I think I'm sort of wrapping up. So where we are now is, um, uh, well, it depends on where you work, where you're now. So, the, so at Delft, we're trying to get this surface code of one into nine qubits to work. And there's been some problem with making a chip that's reliable enough to do these experiments. And uh, we as series can't help that much with it. But in the end of the day, what we'd like to do there is once they run an experiment, they get information from these measurements about the errors. And that information is then you know, sent to us and then we do the decoding. And the type of experiments that we imagine running, and it's been done by a group in ETH, is something like this. So you prepare all the nine data qubits of the surface code, either in all zero and all one. Let's say we do it sort of as a game, like I come into your lab and I prepare all the qubits in all zero and all the qubits in all one, and I'm not telling you what you're doing, what it is, right? Then you go and measure parity checks repeatedly. And you do this for n cycles, right? So you measure the z parity checks of the code n times and the x parity checks of the code n times. And then you measure all the qubits in the z basis. And then on that basis, you have to tell me whether I prepared all zeros or all ones. Only basis of that information. You can't measure like every you know, qubit individually. That's the kind of game that you want to play. And the idea is that the longer n is, the less likely you'll be able to tell whether I prepared all zeros or all ones. That's the time. Now, OK, there's a slight variant of it because actually due to the noise, this is actually easier to do than if you prepare other bit strings. But this is the same idea. And you may want to do the same thing for preparing all pluses or all minuses. And you do all these cycles. And then again, you have to infer from the last measurement that you do and all the error information that you found along the way, you know, what was the initial state? That is sort of an experiment that says, how long can I preserve a qubit? Yeah. How long does the initial state sort of, uh, you know, remain there uh, at the end of the day? Okay, so, um, yeah, and then, then you, get, you get curves. So you get curves sort of like this. So these are, so now I'm, I'm switching to sort of representing some curves from a paper by Google because they are really, you know, have had the rapid events in this. So this is a paper by 2023 in which they compared the performance of a uh, surface code on a five by five letters that can correct two errors versus uh, a surface code that is on a three by three lattice that can correct a single error. That's this one into nine encoding. And the idea of that experiment was to show that the logical error rate here is lower. Eh? So in this memory experiment, it will take more cycles to completely wash out this informa initial information for this uh, scheme than for, for this scheme. But they actually compared this performance to four small sort of uh, experiments. And they found, okay, so let's switch over to here. Here, what we have on the vertical axis, getting good at this. So what we have on the, on the horizontal axis is the quantum error correction cycles. So this is this, uh, you know, how, how, how long I've, I'm measuring these parity checks. And I said, like, the longer it gets, the, the poorer, the, the more I, you know, I lose my initial information. And that is captured by the logical fidelity, right? In the end, you know, I have a sort of probability of a half of saying, you know, it was all zeros, all ones. I'm basically completely clueless. Okay, and this curve, so the point is that the blue curve are the data points for the experiments where I have the five by five lattice. 
which lies slightly above the red curve, which are the data points for when I have the three by three lattice. So it says that only slightly the performance of this, this lattice is, is better. And this is, of course, the essential point we want to show that more redundancy, so a five by five lattice, and as soon we'll have a seven by seven lattice, or they will have a seven by seven lattice, it will get you better performance. And this is a very crucial sort of, you know, transition point because, you know, once you're sort of above it and you say you go to nine by nine, assuming that the error rates are the same, this, these curves, like I said, the error rate will, you know, drop exponentially with, with this sort of linear size. See, three, five, seven, it will go down very rapidly, right? So that's where we want to be. And they're sort of, you know, almost there or not quite, I mean, I would say, right? Because um, it's still not, com not as complicated. All right, so now that, that uh, leads me to my last slide after all these technological hip hiccups. Um, yeah, so where do we stand? As I said, the, the journey will be long, and I want to illustrate that with a slide from a science uh, paper from 2013, so that's 10 years ago, where the sort of outline was made, here's time, here's what we can do, we can do operation single qubit gates, yeah, we're done with that, we can run some variational algorithms, done with that, we can do pretty good measurements, and now we're trying to make a memory which you know, lasts longer than more redundancy we're at, we have, or lasts longer than what we can do with physical qubits, and the point I want to make is that we're kind of still at this step, right? So the 10 years have passed, but we're still, you know, making those strides. And what we can expect in the future is some people have already done operations on single qubit, single logical qubits. But then, of course, you want to run algorithms on, sing on multiple logical qubits, and then this holy grail of full time quantum computation. Okay, this, so that was my sort of overview of what's been happening in, um, in this area. Thanks for your attention. Thank you very much. That was a great talk. Uh, so, are there time for a few questions? Yeah. Back there. Yeah. You. Yeah, I, I think it would be helpful. That, I mean, they do, pub they do publish information, of course. I think, um, but, but maybe there are some secrets, you know. In the, I think there's some more material science secrets that you don't always hear, and also some chip fabrication or chip variability things that are not very well shared. Um, and maybe we should ask them in their papers when we refree the papers to ask more for more information about that. Yeah. And of course, they also patent a lot of stuff to make sure that they are, you know, get credit for it at some point or, yeah. Okay, any other? Yeah. Thank you for the talk. I wonder, um, so a lot of the uh, quantum algorithms right now are using C0, but in the physical, like the one that you just showed, they are using CZ. It feels like people are thinking the Hadamardi is kind of free of errors. Is this my wrong uh, understanding of what <laughs> happening? When yeah, yeah, the, the Hadamard gate, like it's one of the single qubit gates. I, I didn't say especially the times, but the the error rate on the single qubit gates is typically quite a bit lower than the two qubit gates. So to do an extra Hadamard gate is not a big problem. So if I want to calculate the fidelity of my quantum circuit, can I safely assume that if I need a Hadamard gate, it just kind of it's, it's free of errors and then I could ignore it? Yeah, well, depending on what accuracy is a good first approximation, but of course it depends on what accuracy you want to reproduce things. But uh, yeah, I think that's a fair yeah. I think that the the point is also that the you know the problem is that if this, the the control not gate or the CZ gate, if it fails, it can put two errors down, right? It can put a correlated error down, and that that is also not not so nice. Whereas a single qubit error, just single qubit gate is a single qubit error. Uh, sorry, I have another question. Um, so uh, the, this coherent errors is some, somehow related to this crosstalk when we were talking about the superconducting chips. And um, so when I was at another conference, people were telling me that although crosstalk could, uh, could be handled by this dynamic decoupling, 
But in fact, it's actually very, very hard to realize. So as a theorist, like sometimes people just say, well, you could put it on paper that, oh, we could ignore crosstalk because we have the solution. But sometimes uh, people from experimental side tell me this is too naive. So how, sh how should I balance this? Well, they do, there is, they do dynamical decoupling. So for example, if, if ancilla qubits are measured, you're doing dynamical decoupling on the data qubits because then you have a longer uh, you know, phase coherence. So this dephasing times improves. So, so it's not, it, they, they, I mean, I think the point is more complicated dynamical decoupling schemes may not be the way to go. So it's just the basic schemes that are actually are used quite extensively, at least for the transmon qubits. What are the basic schemes? Well, like a, a spin echo, for example. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's a very simple, that's the, and there's CPMG. So there's some very basic, so it's not like it doesn't take a new theory to develop these. That's what I want to say. Okay, this thank you. Yeah. Okay, maybe one other quick question. Okay, well, if not, let's thank uh, Barbara again for a okay. lovely talk. <laughs>